So good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to uh, the Boston University School of Public Health. Um, uh, for those I don't know, I'm Sandra Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the School of Public Health here. Uh, this is uh, one of our um, more or less quarterly symposia where we invite uh, people from all over the world who are experts in a particular area to uh, talk about a topic that we think has real contemporary consequence. And uh, today we are uh, partnering with the uh, Lancet Commission on Trump administration and uh, health to really tackle this question of how is it that um, what is going on currently in the national political scene influences the health of populations. For many of us who are in the field of public health, it is uh, very clear, there's abundant data, that political decisions, policy decisions, make an enormous impact for health, and they make an impact for health not just today, but also in the next decade, in the next decade, and in the next decade. We have seen this in the United States in terms of the trajectories of health after previous administrations and what they've done. And we are in an administration that is, you know, this is an, I think, a nonpartisan statement that is really trying to shake things up, is trying to change how things are done. And that will have implications for health. We have asked today's speakers to present as much as possible from the data, to present from the data. Now, obviously, we're a year and a half into the administration, and uh, there are relatively few data, but we have data and experience from previous um, administrations and previous decades which we can draw on. So the point about today really is to say, is to interrogate the question, how is it that what's happening right now politically is going to affect our health, not just today, but also affect our health in coming decades. I think it's going to be a really um, interesting day. We have, um, our general format is that we have, our, we have asked our speakers to speak for about 10 minutes, and um, the, it's in, divided into four panels. We have uh, somebody from the media chairing each panel, and after each speaker speaks, then we'll have the three speakers up front with one of our colleagues in media uh, who will lead a Q&A, both among the panelists, but also engaging the audience. So I think we're actually in for a treat, and thank you all for being here. Now this day, uh, really, although I'm standing here on stage, is uh, not my brainchild, it's really the brainchild of the Lancet Commission. And uh, the Lancet Commission is co-chaired by uh, two long-standing co uh, colleagues, Dr. Steffi Wilhandler and Dr. David Himmelstein. And just to give you a thumbnail sketch about both of them, um, both Steffi and David are long-term leaders in the field of social medicine and thinking a little bit about how the world around us, society around us, influences our health. Just by way of uh, identification, they are both uh, distinguished professors at the City University of New York, uh, Hunter College in New York City, although they had a long stint uh, before that in Boston at the Harvard School of Public Health. They have published abundant number of articles in uh, all the right places. Um, I think most impressively, both Steffi and David have always navigated the world between the academic world and the practice world. They are both co-founders of Physicians for a National Health Program, and uh, they have been very influential scholars on studies of things like medical bankruptcy, waste in hospitals and medicine, and the lethality of being uninsured. Um, on a personal note, uh, both uh, Steffi and David have been the kind of people that I've always looked up to who really have done very solid science, and, uh, but have been committed to using that science to make the world a better place. So it's really a privilege working with them. Steffi, David? Um, so thanks so much. Sandro credits the, the Lancet Commission for uh, uh, organizing this session, but really he's the organizer of this session. Um, the logistics have really been uh, unbelievably beautifully handled and the, the uh, welcome that he's provided for us. Um, but more important, he provides a, uh, an intellectual milieu that uh, makes us feel able to uh, address the issues of the day in, in uh, a way that is both serving the academic and the human needs that our society so greatly needs today. So uh, I'm going to turn things over to Steffi at this point. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, well the Lancet Commission um, is a commission that grew out of some earlier work we did with the Lancet on uh, health and inequality in the United States, uh, which is five large papers, which was published in the Lancet, and this is the cover. Um, and the, you know, the bad news on the cover is that it's very gray weather politically, very gray weather in terms of policy. But the very good news is Lady Liberty is still standing, and that's fundamentally what this symposium is about: is about saying that we still. We still have liberty in this country, we still have a right to advocate, and we still have the possibility of making a more inclusive and free society. Um, 
Now, people may be surprised at a medical journal being engaging in such uh, outright uh, advocacy, but in fact, uh, Thomas Wackley was the founding editor of The Lancet, and he wrote back in 1838, we deplore the state of society which allows various sets of mercenary, goose-brained monopolists and charlatans to usurp the highest privileges. This is the canker worm which eats into the heart of the medical body. So long tradition of calling out things that are harmful to the public health and really uh, urging people to, to change that. And that's really what this whole commission's about. Uh, and you're about to hear of all the various areas where the commission has been doing work. But before doing that, I just want to thank a few people. Uh, Rebecca Cooney, who's our Lancet North American editor, who's sitting here. Obviously, Boston University School of Public Health. And then uh, our funders, the Open Society Foundations and Doris Duke Charitable Trust. Thank you, Steffi. Thank you, David. So we, um, we're going to open the day with a, with a, a keynote presentation uh, from uh, really one of the uh, uh, best speakers on this topic in the country, um, Dr. Mary Bassett. So briefly to introduce Dr. Bassett, um, Dr. Bassett is, um, was appointed commissioner of New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in January 2014. And uh, she comes to that appointment after a long career in the academic world coupled with the world of public health practice. She, um, after her medical training at Columbia, she moved to Zimbabwe where she was on medical faculty for 17 years. And while she was there, she developed HIV uh, prevention uh, interventions to address one of the world's, weight, world's worst AIDS epidemic. She served later as the associate director of the Health Equity at the Rockefeller Foundation South Africa office, um, overseeing this Africa AIDS portfolio. She was, uh, in 2002, she was appointed deputy commissioner of health promotion and disease prevention in New York City Department of Mental Hygiene. And then she went from there to the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation as program director for the African Health Initiative. Um, in the academic world, Dr. Bassett has for many years served as associate editor of the American Journal of Public Health, um, uh, became, being in and out of New York City where she grew up. On a personal note, I've known uh, Mary for a long time. Uh, we're, we're in the same department when I was uh, in New York City at Columbia, and I have uh, come to deeply admire um, uh, Dr. Bassett's deep commitment to both science and to social justice. Mary, pleasure having you. Well, good, good morning, everyone, and, uh, and thank you, Sandra, for that generous introduction. I have uh, really been honored to participate in this symposium. I watch them. It's really an excellent series. I refer people at the health department to them. And I'd also like to thank the co-chairs of the Lancet Commission on Public Policy and Health in the Trump era. That's its formal title. Uh, uh, Steffi Wilhandler and, and uh, David Himmelstein, who you've just heard from. Now, we are all wearied by the frenzied emanations coming from Washington. And I know that many of us may be feeling fatigued, but it's absolutely critical that we keep in mind the importance and of our work in protecting the communities against, uh, that we all serve against the actions of the Trump presidency. And we had a closed meeting yesterday, and I, it's been a pleasure to meet many of my old friends here, uh, many of whom share my gray hair, but I was especially pleased that we have the involvement of younger researchers and public health workers. I don't think any of my old friends would mind me saying how important that is to our work. I'm the New York City Health Commissioner, and I have the privilege of working under Bill de Blasio, who has committed not only to resisting the myriad of Trump policies, but to subverting them. And I'm really proud that just last week, uh, the mayor announced that New York City is going to continue its tradition as a public health pioneer. He committed to opening overdose prevention centers in New York City. You should clap for that. When New York City does things, it really matters. These are going to make a safe space for people who use drugs so that they can avoid uh, the risk of fatal overdose. So I'm hoping to bring some of this energy as we get started today. I have a big task, and now I have to see if I can do, how do I do it? The green button, yeah. I have a big task. I have 20 minutes. At least I thought I had 20 minutes. If I have 10, I, I apologize in advance <laughs> to, um, to talk about how I believe Trump has and will impact public health. And given how viral and how frequent this president's declarations are, uh, this is a pretty tall order. So 
I decided that although I'm going to touch on his specific policies, threats, and rumors, I'm going to focus mostly on the impact of his rhetoric and the coded thinking that lurks behind the lurch to the right uh, as a pathway to making America great. And I'm talking about the framing, which is really a reframing of the U.S. as a white man's country and about the long legacy, a uh, bloodstained legacy, a commitment to white supremacy in this country that is not new, did not start with the current president. In fact, it reaches back beyond the founding of ourselves as a nation. And I see the impact of this thinking already entering the public health arena. And I think that I really want to leave you today with a vision of how important it is that we talk about racism and white supremacy. I also don't think that I should raise problems without talking about how we are addressing them, so I'm going to take some time to talk about what the department is doing. I don't need to point out to you how toxic uh, the climate has become for public health and the many ways in which the Trump administration has demonstrated that public health is under attack, including its own federal agency. At the health department, we have sort of cataloged these ideas. Uh, it's not just the executive, it's the legislature, it's very frighteningly the judiciary. Uh, we are worried about the many attempts to repeal the Affordable Care Act, the efforts to restrict funding for women's health care, the repeated threats to completely defund Planned Parenthood, very worryingly the attack on environmental regulations, the decision to let DACA expire, we all know that all of these will affect health. I could go on and on. The hostile anti-immigrant policies have a host of, of anecdotes uh, for us in New York City. Uh, and as, uh, as Dean Galea mentioned, we are in the early stages of documenting with data, but this is a key role of public health. Um, so we're going to be hearing about some of the data today. In New York City, we've recently looked at uh, the occurrence of preterm birth in the city uh, and to look at the timing uh, with the campaign, the inauguration, uh, and we have some suggestive data not yet published, and that we are seeing in certain populations, particularly Latina women, an increase in the number of preterm deliveries. And I'm going to turn later to how we are uh, tackling the whole issue of, of maternal and child health, and particularly the, the deep racial divide that exists. But I want to return to what I alluded to in my introductory, introductory remarks. And that is the legacy of white supremacy in, um, in public health. And like any good epidemiologist, any good public health worker, I have to define my terms. There are lots of definitions of white supremacy. Many of them hinge on the existence of extremist hate groups. I thought I would take a photograph of some women dressed up in Klan garb um, uh, for this slide. Uh, but that is not really what it means to have, um, to have white supremacy embedded in our country. It is a built-in logic of white superiority and entitlement that undergirds all of our social and economic systems. And importantly, one of the key tactics of, of, um, of white supremacy is division and erasure of people of color. I was just, before we got started this morning, having a conversation with Michael Byrd about the invisibility of the indigenous peoples of our country. The notions um, have been embedded in the medical and public health thinking for a long time. Uh, the, many of you may have heard of drapetomania. How many of you have heard of drapetomania? Ah, not as many as I would have thought. This was a disease, a psychiatric disease, discovered by Sam Cartwright. He was not a nut. He was a recognized and respected uh, Southern physician. Uh, it was the disease that caused, sla caused slaves to run away. Uh, so the notion of running away was considered pathological. Uh, its treatment, you won't be surprised to learn, was whipping. Uh, and then he was followed after the Civil War by the work, uh, really, 
uh, copious work by Frederick Hoffman, who was an actuary for an insurance company, who documented high mortality rates in the newly freed population and used these data to demonstrate the lack of fitness in the black population. He even predicted that blacks would simply become um, extinct because of their intrinsic lack of fitness as demonstrated by their inabilities to survive free. Uh, I can't talk about the legacy of uh, scientific racism and without mentioning Marion Sims. That's his statue there. It's now an empty plinth. Oh, thank you. It's now an empty plinth. Uh, and he, thanks very much, David. And he uh, is uh, the guy who uh, invented surgical techniques still used today. Uh, that are um, that were developed uh, on enslaved women who he procured and operated on repeatedly without anesthesia, although it was available at the time. So this is the legacy, but it's making it onto the front pages of our newspapers today. Just recently, there was a front page of uh, the of the New York Times Sunday Review that sought to uh, re-engage uh, with the idea that. Somehow, it's a form of political correctness not to acknowledge the genetic basis of race. The picture there on your left uh, shows these old-fashioned ideas, but these ideas aren't gone. Every time we think that we have overcome the idea that blacks are distinct biologically or other people of color are distinct biologically, it comes back. And I was pleased to see a very robust response uh, to the resumption of what I would characterize as essentially a racist discourse uh, from the academic community. The many letters were sent to the editor. But the implication is that we have to be vigilant. And I want to give you a couple of examples of how race is continuing to be viewed as something intrinsic and biological. Uh, it dates back, as I've said, uh, this is Jane Addams, at least I hope it is. I have to, uh, Jane, uh, that, that, that is Jane Addams. And we all admire her. She's the founder of social work. She founded the very, um, very courageous uh, settlement house uh, movement. And she believed that only white European immigrants could benefit from this strategy. Uh, she saw blacks as uh, lacking in the civilization bona fides to permit permit them to benefit. They needed social control, not social services. And we see this argument playing out again in the whole narrative around opioids. And for many observers, uh, this, uh, this has been a, a, a painful saga because, of course, the, uh, the humanization of what it means to be dependent on drugs is appropriate. Uh, but, of course, the suffering of communities of color have been ex obscured, and the uh, answer for the black community's heroin epidemic of previous de decades uh, was the war on drugs. Trump has sort of taken a very interesting bifurcated approach to the opioid epidemic. On the one hand, in October of last year, he said this epidemic is a national emergency, no part of our society, not young, old, rich, poor, urban, rural, has been spared. Uh, but what he didn't mention in his universalist approach was that no race has been spared, and that although the current epidemic is, has largely a white face, it continues to affect communities of color. In my city, in New York City, the rates of, uh, of overdose mortality are going down in Manhattan and Staten Island, largely wealthier, whiter boroughs in New York, and they continue to go up in Brooklyn and the Bronx. I'm very worried uh, that the narrative around opioid dependence may shift as the face of the epidemic shifts as it appears to be doing in our city and in others. Uh, so Trump, uh, while talking about uh, encoded language, the burden uh, of opioids on the white population has been vilifying the sources of, uh, of, um, of, the, of drugs. Uh, he said at the same time that he was talking in October that 90% of heroin uh, in America comes from south of the border. That's why we're building a wall. And that will really help the problem. He had ICE agents come on the stage with him while he talked about um, 
about his idea that there should be a drug penalty for drug dealers uh, who are all coded to be Latino. So on the one hand, uh, we see this supposed more human view. On the other hand, he is suggesting a new war on drugs. Another example is um, the data offered by the Princeton uh, analysts, um, uh, Case and Deaton. Angus Deaton uh, is a Nobel laureate. I don't know if you can make this out, but uh, this is what appeared in the New York Times above the fold. Uh, and it's this very worrying rise in mortality for white Americans. White Americans have their usual comparators, at least according to Case and Deaton. Uh, they're looking, they com should be compared to France, Germany, Britain, Canada, Australia, and Sweden. Although they did add one group uh, to the slide. Uh, they wrote, they added Latinos who are doing about the same as Britain. Uh, but there was a group that they didn't add. Well, actually, having participated in the conversation, there were at least two uh, groups that they didn't add. But notably, the African-American mortality rates didn't appear. So this is what happens when a bunch of epidemiologists and not, uh, not, not uh, the New York Times creates a graphic. But this is the same data, at least the data are publicly available. And the green line on top is African-Americans. Uh, they noted, and uh, Deaton and Case, that they didn't really, they weren't interested in this part of the story. Uh, and it wasn't actually able, they couldn't fit it, you know, on that slide. So there um, you can see that although mortality has fallen, it remains 50% higher among blacks than among whites. And this is what we mean when we talk about white supremacy resulting in erasure. Literally, populations become invisible and in this case don't appear because they can't fit on the graph. The next uh, thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about um, was the way in which we at the health department are seeking to monitor uh, and, uh, and document the impact of policies, rumors, and threats. Uh, we began meeting as a group um, shortly after uh, the election uh, and we created this framework, which I'll go over briefly with you, uh, that is, has been adopted by this group of health departments in urban areas called the Big Cities Health Coalition. Uh, we publish, um, and I'm not sure that we make it public, but maybe we should think about it. We've done now three quarterly reports um, which, in which we uh, established uh, a, a, a surveillance system that identified core domains, indicators, data sources, and uh, we're now seeking to add additional data sources from the federally qualified health centers, from food pantries, from Planned Parenthood. And we identified 30 indicators across these domains uh, in which we are tracking every month. We're not seeing much yet, but I'm very, uh, but I think it's very important that public health step forward and use our surveillance capacity uh, because uh, we, we, need, we, we created a, a baseline from a decade ago and I feel confident that over time uh, we will find, uh, find some, um, we'll find impact because these policies will affect uh, our population. I mentioned the early uh, warning signal that we've had for preterm pre birth. New York City, like the rest of the country, has large racial disparities in infant mortality, maternal uh, mortality, and severe maternal morbidity. We are committed as a city not only to lowering our rates, but narrowing the gap uh, between populations. And we have launched what we call the Birth Equity Initiative that takes a three-pronged approach, promotes safe sleep, housing quality, uh, because people won't put their kid to sleep in a crib if they have no heat, for example. Uh, reducing toxic stress and improving women's health. Uh, we are working with other agencies across the city government, and we are also leveraging our data. Although maternal deaths are fairly rare, we have about 30 a year, there's a very strong racial gradient in the maternal mortality outcomes, and as you know, in our country, maternal mortality is rising, although it isn't in our city. We are also doing surveillance for maternal morbidity, uh, severe um, 
outcomes which are, uh, are, should be thought of as near misses. And those are 100 times more frequent than maternal mortality. So we have 3,000 severe maternal morbidity events uh, as opposed to 30. And we are, for the first time in our agency's history, working truly collaboratively in an ongoing way with a group of, of uh, sexual and reproductive justice advocates in our community. Uh, we're focusing on working with hospitals to make sure not only that they adhere to standard of care, which is an issue, but that they become more aware of what it means to have dignified and respectful care and the role of bias in damaging that. Last, the department has um, looked at itself. And I, I guess as health commissioner, I, this is one of the things that I feel most proud of, although I doubt that it will ever make it to any headlines. When I became commissioner, uh, we, there was not a single black or Latino in the senior leadership of the health department team. Um, and that's what we look like now. I like to say when I, I brag about this often, ah, I'm going backwards. There. Oh, wrong one. There. All right. That's the team. Um, the, uh, so you can see this is the most diverse leadership team that the department's ever seen. It's majority non-white, like our city. Uh, and I like to brag about this. And I always also add that we have added some men to the, <laughs> to the leadership team. Uh, so this is not uh, cosmetic. Um, the, uh, you know, this is because this is the type of leadership we need uh, to get our, to do our work and provide the quality work that New York City's taxpayers pay us to do. Uh, and we've begun very difficult conversations. Uh, we have a bunch of, of documents. Uh, these are publicly available. Uh, we have uh, created a, a homegrown uh, version of training, uh, seven hours, uh, which oh, a, a sixth of our workforce, that's, which is a over 1,000 people, uh, have uh, participated in. Uh, we have trained hundreds of people, starting with the leadership, moving down with the goal of covering everyone and implicit bias. And with my few seconds remaining, I want to leave you with what I think is the right way to challenge the thinking in the Trump era. Uh, I am, was affected greatly by Ibram Kendi, uh, who uh, did a, uh, won a National Book Award for his uh, very voluminous volume on uh, the history of racist ideas. Uh, he uh, points out that there's a really simple way to ask ourselves, are we dealing with a racist idea? Because if we as humans, as a group, are all equal, and by this I don't mean that I am equal to you or you, or, but as a group we are all equal, then we have to ask ourselves what explains the racial patterning of disease. And there are basically two answers. Either it's inherent in the people, in their culture, or their genes, uh, or it's the context. Almost always you're going to hear that the problem is the people. And when you hear that, ask yourself, interrogate this as a racist idea. Thank you very much. I guess I have time for questions. Huh? Two questions. I'm so relieved, I have to tell you. <laughs> I got through. I have a, a group of animal rights activists who have been disrupting my public talks. And if any of them are in the room, I would like to thank them for allowing me to speak on the topic that I think is important to us all.